didn't know Tony before now. I didn't know he was, uh, well, he actually, he was Louisiana at first, and then went from there to Tennessee, and uh, I thought he was a black man when I first heard his, his voice and his music and all, of Hook Salad Annie. But they call it Swamp Rock, and I think that's perfect for the title of it. We get on qu quite well. Actually, the songs were written about the early stages of my life and my mother's life, I think. Steamy Windows, Undercover Agent, uh, you know you know who is doing you know what. Really great song. Yeah, that's a good phrase, you know who is. Yeah, is doing you know what. <laughs> that's really cheeky, isn't it? <laughs> is that something you've heard before? My mother used to use those terms. Uh, when she was speaking in code language when we were children, she didn't want us to know she was talking about the neighbor. She would always use that. And I, I, I myself never used that term, but when I heard it, I knew it well, and I, I immediately took the telephone and, and told my mother what it was. <laughs> so she was delighted. You felt instant at home with these uh, songs from Turn of Your Life, then? Ah, uh, yes. It was definitely a relation to a way of life that I knew. Sure. And it plays on the album, too, of course. Ah, uh, yes, of course. I, I would still been in the recording studio if he had not been there. Because his style of playing, it was really needed. The only other person I can think of that could have Excuse me, could have played that, would have been Mark Knopfler. Yeah. But Tony wanted to, and uh, it worked out fine. Yeah. Tony, do you have a song, Steamy Windows, is, is one of the songs we're going to see in our program. It's just, right. It is a steamy song. It's a steamy song. I'm a little bit worried about the video on that one. Mm -hmm. They got me to ride the horse again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you seem to, uh, to be able to cope with that too, don't you? What, the video? Yeah, and the, the horse riding, horse pig riding. Oh yeah, I did it. I, yeah. I enjoyed it and, and I plan to continue to ride. Yeah. That was that was very nice. It was opening another door that had been opened, you know, when I grew up. I was a mm -hmm. farm girl and riding horses mm -hmm. and I just didn't ride since then, so I'm not afraid of the animals. Mm -hmm. It was it was wasn't easy, of course. Three days training is not enough to ride for two hours, but uh, I got it done and, and I'm I really liked it. <coughs> There's sort of a very happy mood over the LP in, in total, I think. Yeah, it is. Would you agree? I do agree. It was like that in the recording studio as well. I, I felt at the finish of that album that it was the best album that I have ever done and that I could possibly ever do. I hate to speak for the future, but speaking in terms of, it's very, it's difficult to get good lyrics from writers. They don't always come up with great, nobody can come up with a great song every night. If so, then the writers would have songs in the charts forever. But when a good surge of songs come through, you're fortunate if you can get one of those, you know, and, and, and I, that's what this album is. I, I really got in there just in time with these people. Yeah. You like a good lyric. You have to sing them. That's right. One, one girl asked me, she said, the lyrics are not important for you because you like to dance. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> that's first. The first, the, the music gets your attention, and then, you know, you start to yeah. deliver the song, and then you start to dance to what you're saying, actually. That's what the whole thing is. But for a while, I mean, everybody thought of you as a dancer, isn't that so? Because I did covers. Yeah. The songs weren't my own. They were covers of... But it's the same. I took them with the same attitude as if they were my own. Mm -hmm. And um, made them mine in terms of my performances and my delivery. Yeah. Right. The first song that came out was The Best. And it just covers everything, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. That song is, um, I would say, different than any song on the album. But it, you can't say it is the best song on the album, but it's the best in its, its own way. Each song in their own right is as good as the other, but different because they're all so different. That's what's good about the album is there's not one or two songs that's alike necessarily. I felt the best, I have the credibility now of being rock singer and it's, it's still leading, it's still contributing to that, that, uh, that, that award mm -hmm. that I've contributed you know, for myself. And I want to keep it. I don't want to lose that uh, rock credibility. So that's why I felt that it should have been the best. Good song. Good all, all in a, the, the longer it goes, the, the more it gets you, you know. In the videos, you, you, you get to act, of course. Yes, You've absolutely. done acting before, but yeah. do you see it all as, as preparation for the big movie? I do. I do really do. I mean, it's, it's very nice of you to say so rather than have me to say it. It's, uh, it's rehearsing the camera. You're still singing, and you're still too big for the camera mostly, and acting is much smaller. But at least you're working the camera. That's, that's, that's what the relation is, is starting to be able to play off of it and know how to play the camera, you know? So, uh, you just don't look right into camera all the time, you know, when you're 
when you're singing even or when you but that's what the videos and the commercials and all of that is for me it's um, that that first stage before you go into yeah. really finally doing it but, but can you can you cope with the cameras are you in love with them because they they follow you wherever you go don't they oh once i'm doing what i'm doing i i, I just totally ignore them unless i need to work the camera for some reason but today on television i had to a cameraman that was they were using some shots where he was right there it was difficult to get away from him it was like this shadow went to go move i can't see what i'm doing <laughs> but ah, you know what it is and you know what it's about so you can play with it and because sometimes even in acting you have that as well you yeah. know but when has the movie come to you know, with you i don't know movies are not like records you know you can contact a writer and a few writers and within a year's time you can have an album done it takes sometimes mm. a few years to even do a movie I went to Hollywood, I met all the people involved with making movies. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of the right script being written. I wouldn't take a part that was not good enough just to be on, on the screen, you know? But you have an idea of what you would like to do. Yeah, I've, I've made it very clear. I want action adventure. Yeah. I, I, I love the movie Die Hard with Bruce Willis. I love what Sigourney Weaver did in Alien and that type of... Uh, mm -hmm. Of, of casting for, for, for the first few years. It's, I'd like to enjoy that type of work. Yeah. And then by then, I think I would be comfortable with acting enough to really take a serious part. Yeah. But it's definitely action adventure. It's, I just want to go straight from the stage with basically what I do onto camera with that same type of energy. Would you like the movies to have song and dance to? And no, I don't want musicals. Because otherwise, I might as well stay here and do what I'm doing. I don't want to sing. I can always sing in my work, you know. Movies, I want to act. The thing that's being filmed right now is, is uh, your book, I, Tina. What does it mean to you now to have it filmed? Nothing. Nothing? Yes. I think if you were, you were actually doing a movie on present life, yeah. it's more exciting. Yeah. I was not excited to write that book, you know. I don't... Uh, it was a time in my life that was not very nice, was embarrassing. And uh, I wrote the book because I was a bit tired of talking about the past, and it stopped. But now, ha, so they're doing movies, so there's more talk. You're keeping this thing alive. It's like cancer, you know, it goes on. So it, uh, I'm happy when it's finished and it's done and it's passed and then it's completely, everything it's, is said and done. And People saw what it looked like, possibly, yeah. I guess. And uh, that's it. But how did you yourself rise again after when you started out on your own? What, what, what I had a great think? cup of coffee. Yeah. And that did it? I started it. Mm -hmm. What was the comeback? The beginning of the comeback? Yeah, but I mean, but, I mean that, that whole period, can you say now that that's it now, totally, and, and just be, be able to, to move away from that period? I have moved away. It's been 13 years. Yeah. It's been more years than yeah. people really think, you see. Because when my divorce was, there were no records. I can see they had no hit records, so it wasn't publicized. So when the people found out, they didn't relate to it having to have been a few years ago. I had been working practically five years when the public found that there was no Argentina anymore. So that was why everybody just sort of jumped on the wagon to try to find out what, you know, that type of thing. And it, it sort of gets a bit nutty a bit, you know, you talk about the past 10, 10, 13 years ago, it's almost what, I forgot it two and a half years after I was done. After my divorce was finished, it was gone. I was totally finished with it. In 84, you released the Private Dancer LP, which is considered sort of your comeback LP. Did you know at that time that this was going to be it, that now? Actually, it was a record called Let's Stay Together. I was uh, just traveling basically on the cover versions and old songs and uh, doing a European tour and went into the Persian Gulf from that. That song was recorded just for to have a song released. And I remember some some the promoter's wife rang and she said, you've got a hit record in London, let's stay together. I said, call my manager. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know how to deal with a hit record, this was something foreign. And then after that was when I realized what was, why you should call the manager. It's time for a producer, it's time for songs, it's time for another whole world. And that's exactly what it was. After that tour, finishing the tour, we did it in London and I went on stage with a hit record. And I saw what the feeling was. It was, um, I'm going to get around to answering your question, yeah. but that was the beginning of saying, oh, yeah, that's what it feels like to have it. There's some presence 
that goes with a hit record? It means it's the now rather than people coming to see you as a performer. Private dancer. No, I didn't. I didn't know what to think. I didn't think at the time. I just felt we have to do an album to follow up a single because that is that is the record business. I'd sort of gotten out of the record business. I was basically just touring. I had no thoughts about whether it'd be a hit or what. I just had material out. It was my first album, I, Tina. Mm -hmm. My very first one out. There were a lot of songs that I liked, some that I felt was okay, but that's all that I felt. Yeah. But it really became... Oh, it definitely became. I think about... I went home after that with the Let's Stay Together single and go, and I... I moved all of the Ike and Tina records to one side of a wall, and I had quite a bit of space, and I just said to myself, I want to see how well I would do with my life with records, and I thought there'll be a few more goals, I might get a few platinums, I just thought re realistically. My goodness, I went home with this Let's Stay Together, and I stood in the room and I looked at that. <laughs> Two months later, that wall was full, they were stacked on the floor in both sides of the room, it was like I had no room for these, where there was only proud mirrors still standing, and slowly it got shifted around. It just, it, is, it was like it exploded. Riverdeep Mountain High was the first time Tina was on her own. And you were yeah. called upon by Phil Spector. Let's just have a few words on that recording. Yeah. Because it still is a classic. Well, I can Tina worked um, the small clubs in California. And there was always a little man there, sitting, hidden almost. And uh, I remember once asking, do you guys see this person there? And it was Phil. He was having a look at the show because he, he was organizing a TNT special. And um, he wanted to possibly to, to, to work with Ike and I. Then we met him. And then he still came because then he wanted to produce me for the song he had. And he didn't know how to arrange that because he knew at the time that... Um, I was basically self-produced and, you know, that never been an outsider. So it came through the record company and the company assured I that he thought it was a big step for crossover, etc. So that was um, my first uh, encounter with, with Phil. And then I, I went to his house to work with him for two weeks on the song. And then the studio. Well, that was quite uh, an experience. And of course, you know, there were about, it seemed like 75 musicians, maybe it was 25 and what seemed like 25 singers, which might have been 15, but it was a choir and an orchestra. And as I entered the studio to do vocals for the recording, Phil was tearing up the, the arrangements <laughs> because something had been printed wrong. And then he started to conduct the orchestra. And it was just, it was, for me, incredible because I had to sing to that music, and it was totally different from any music that I've been singing with for a long time. Even though there had been bands, uh, seven, p uh, seven uh, piece uh, horn sections, etc., which can be quite large, but not an orchestra with oboes and strings and all that, you know, and that was huge. And he felt that my voice alone would be the one to stand on top of the sound yeah. that he wanted to get. So that was how it all happened. Did you ever think of your voice to be able to cope with a song like that because it was so different from anything else you've done before? Unreal. Unreal because I've never heard a song like that type of song. And I've, nothing Phil ever pr pr produced was like that, even though the Ronettes, it was his sound, but not that massiveness. Maybe the girls' uh, voices weren't very strong, that's why he didn't produce them that way or didn't give that song to them or whatever. I have very masculine voice it's, it's always been very strong it's always very deep and the resonance and so i guess that's why he might have felt that my voice would be right for what he wanted to do with that another tina turner classic is not bush tina so i'd like to talk about it tina, you want he... to go to that bush i know yes i know <laughs> you know how fascinated i am about the south so i mean few people know that it is actually the place you were born yeah it is so you, it's a your first autobiography yes, isn't it? that's right <laughs> It, it, it's a quaint little community. It's still very nice. The stores are very white. Well, they were last time I saw them. Well, I'm saying it's kept up. Highway number 19 is still there. The gin house is still there. The church house is still there. The outhouse is still there. Everything is still there. It's still vivid. The little rock roads, very red, and the coloring of the, the, the roads. And so it's sort of very visual if you want to. 
So you wrote that song? <laughs> I wrote that verse, and it went on the map. Yeah, it sure, <laughs> sure did. Do they, the people back home, do they realize that they're on the world map now? They do, and word of mouth came through friends and all that. Uh, everybody knew that little Anna Mae had uh, written a song about them. And they were, I, I guess I could say please is the word that I got. And yeah. I did go back once way years before all, all of this success, and I saw everyone, but it, it's nothing like compared to what it is now. You know, I think it was even before I'd written that bush, you know. So it's, uh, a lot of houses are torn down. A lot of houses are still standing, but it's not exactly like it was. But basically, the community is still there. We came to talk about the year 2000. What was it you were mentioning about the, the big thing coming up there? Yeah, we were speaking about, in Europe, you need to speak the languages because if you cross the border, you won't be understood. And I thought, well, won't it be great when all you have to do is cross the border with a language rather than your passport? I thought the year of 2000, when you could actually sit there and write it down, everyone should get new stationery for the year 2000. So when you really put it down, it's really fresh and new. I think Europe is going to be wonderful, man. I, I, I look forward to being here for that. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's really a long way from... No, it's not. <laughs> Oh, it's a long way from, yeah. from Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant. Oh, yes. I made a point <coughs> years ago when I first went to the UK that this was my side of the world. This was where I wanted to be. This is where I would end up. It took 28 years. Hmm. Nearly 28 years. Definitely 20 years. I have an idea. Like in the 60s, we had a lot of best American bluesmen coming over here. Mm -hmm. But sort of the Atlantic Ocean separates the real good thing from what we were not uh, supposed uh, to have over here. Yeah. Or oh, maybe we were just born in the wrong place or something. <laughs> but isn't it great that the opposites attract, you know, it's we're always attracted to something. Americans from all over the world are just coming here to see your countries and this part of the world. And what, what do we bring? We bring talent and you give us old history. You give us something for the eye, something. It's, it's like how do you call it, it's dealing with your fantasies and all. It's all still here. It's all so wonderful. It's nothing like it. No, absolutely nothing. Have most of your fantasies come true? <sighs> Let's see. I can say definitely. I'm, I'm nearing a stage in my life where I never thought that at this age and stage in my life would it be as fantastic and as exciting as it is. Um, still exploring Europe, still ex enjoying it still having the desire to be here and live here and it's all of what that is because a lot of people say why and why is the answer is you can simply get on a plane or if you prefer to drive your car and, and there's you're a couple of hours away from any any fantasy of yours that you might want and it's all right here all right here together and it's it's so so necessary for me so most of my fantasies have come true yes yeah and you're not frightened one bit that you're sooner turning 50. Oh, now it's wonderful. Because you see, the, the old, so if, we, if we can call it the myth of 50, is uh, old fashioned now. It's not today. Today's 50 is, um, you've got another 10 or 20 years, really. That's what I think it is. I know for sure 10. When my grandmother was 50 years old, totally different dress, totally different mentally. But of course, then I have lived a totally different life. But it's not just me, I'm not the only one. It is a style today that, that women and men have crossed that point, and it's as if they're 35 to 40, or just basically 30s. It's not like it used to be. No. Now, if I got to 80 and this was happening, I would be a bit concerned. <laughs> 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 then it would be strange. <laughs> yeah, and you said that I was going to ask the question about touring, so, <laughs> so I better do, because in one interview you say no and then the next one i might do it yeah what's well, we, today we talked about something <laughs> earlier we said um, it's something about seeing it you can you can see a movie you can see a video and pictures but it's nothing like seeing it with your eye and it's uh, a journalist in england wrote tina didn't didn't plan to do an album and she plans not to tour but wouldn't it be a shame not to tour with such a great album while she's still fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I felt the same because when you have as many young fans that came along with Private Dancer and Break Every Rule, it would be a shame for them not to really see me live on stage. I felt in the beginning, well, great, they have videos, they have all of these pictures, they have all of that. 
But one one more cat killed me, and if it did, oh, what a way to go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, so there is a chance. Yeah, there's a chance. Might say, okay. Why don't we end up then by having you and the band play again? You can't stop me loving you. That's right. You can't stop that, can you? <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Tina, and welcome. good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Where's Tina? That was three years ago. I've grown three years older. <laughs> well, yes. It's another very important birthday coming up. Yeah. Is it important for you? Yes, very. And turning 50? Turning 50. And looking good. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Tina, last time you told us about the hard times. I did? You yeah, you did, with us. And the fact that you, you wrote the autobiography about all the beatings and everything. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to talk about that, but I, I want to know what does it mean to have the power to share these things with others? Ooh, that's a spinner. What does it mean to share it? I didn't mean to share it. I simply was tired of talking about it. Mm. And I needed to say it once more, a final time in order to stop talking about it. I had to let the people know. It wasn't mentally, I didn't think of sharing it. I thought of take this material, look at what my life was, and stop talking to me about my past. That was basically what I was, the statement that I was trying to make. Mm. Because you live an extremely uh, public, uh, so, so to say, life. Yeah. And can you, can you have any privacy? Uh, very little these days. <laughs> I tell someone something once, I said, when I was growing up, you heard a song on the radio, and you saw a picture of the star, and that was it. Mm. Today, you know what color every organ is, you know what time they go to bed, you know, you know everything. I mean, you just totally get exploited. It's, it's a bit ridiculous these days. Mm. You just have no privacy. And if you alienate yourself from it, then you get a bad reputation, and the press can sort of put you down. So you, you have no, you, there's no way to win. But what has this life taught you? Endurance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've learned a lot. I've learned patience. I've learned not to worry so much. Try to worry not so much about what the people say about you because you compare what they say about everybody mm. and you live just very truthful within your own your own life. What you if you can wake up in the morning with a clear conscience and smile, first waking up without even a cup of coffee, you're all right with yourself. And then let the world go, because you can't stop it by trying to correct every little thing that's said about you. you know? mm. That's one of the things I've learned, and that's something I live by now. And I, I wake up uh, in pretty good moods. Mm. You live in Europe, but what in Europe attracts a southern girl like you, a southern oh, girl? <laughs> don't you know it's Europe? Oh, Europe. Europe for Americans is a fantasy land. Mm. It's, it's, it's so far away. It's, it's mysterious. And most of the times when Americans travel here, they don't lose it. There's something about it that's old, but yet, yet always new. There's something about, there's something about old period. It, it's, it has depth because it's been around so long and there's, there's always generations of, um, of ideas that's still moving its way, threading its way through some kind of way. So it's, it's almost untouchable, the magic that Europe holds. And I've been coming for, since 1966 and it's still when I'm, when I'm arriving, it has something there still that's right. You know? mm. So I decided, well, why don't I go and live there and just see what I'm feeling? Because you never know. As long as you go and come, you'll never really find out. But once you go and you live and you learn to speak some of the language and you're really there is when you can really decide, yes, all of those feelings are real. I do feel good there. I will stay here, etc. Mm. So that, that's my attitude about you. That's why I came. I figured, okay, next half of my life, why don't I try it? Why don't I go and see? There's nothing stopping me. My family is fine. My, my sons are grown up. Bertina, I hear you practicing gardening sometimes outside yeah. Cologne. Sprechen Sie Deutsch, Frau You have big ears. <laughs> yes, I do a bit of gardening there, I must say. <laughs> I mean, you're an American living in Europe practicing Buddhism. You're kind of an ideal world citizen. Maybe I can teach someone something. Huh? Mm. <laughs> I'm, uh, yes. Do you think Western civilization lacks spirit? I 
don't want to really speak about her. It's very difficult for one like me to speak about uh, these kind of negative sides of, of life and of countries and people. I just feel like if I'd like how I want to live my life, and I, it doesn't matter where I live it as long as I'm happy there and, and living it. Like what you say is I am an American, I am Europe, I'm living in Europe and I'm practicing Buddhism. If that's what I want to do, I don't pass judgment on anyone. I just feel that this is what I'm comfortable with doing. And if I can do it and remain happy, that's what I'd like to do. And that's what I make a reality at the moment. In this show, Caramba, we've talked a lot about racism today. What are your feelings about racism? What? Racism. Well, what do you want me to say? Whatever. Well, I think um, races are growing. People are becoming more enlightened as the years go on. The world itself, moving into the year 2000, will be all kinds of changes. People are fighting for rights. They're getting rights. And in one way or another, some type of destruction, whether it's uh, <sighs> destruction coming from a spiritual side or from the, the universe itself that will make changes, it's a long way off, but I foresee some kind of peace for the land. I do, because it, it's been so much problems for so long that it either gets very bad and then good comes. Usually there's, after a storm, there's always the good. So, I mean, the storm is really quite heavy at the moment. And I think that good is coming somewhat, maybe it's the year 2000 and right into it, but I foresee some, some type of calmness coming with the generations and races and, and everything coming together some kind of way. It was very nice having you. When are you coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I am coming back, I think it's May. And my manager said that oh, I should tell right? you where I'm playing. <laughs> you have a new hall here called the... Um, Bloomberg. This is the... Glo yes, the Bloomberg. Bloomberg. That's You're right. coming to Bloomberg. Yes, I am. In May. That's good. We don't want to lose you. Tina, the stage is yours. Just for you. All right.